Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. The Turrell Fund, supporting reimagined child care. New Jersey Sharing Network, RWJ Barnabas Health. IBEW Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters. NJM Insurance Group, serving New Jersey's drivers, homeowners, and business owners for more than 100 years. Fedway Associates, Inc. And by the Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. Promotional support provided by ROINJ, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. And by NJ.com keeping communities informed and connected. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Adubato. We kick off the show with Dr. Cindy Jeb, who is the president of Ramapo College of New Jersey. Good to see you, Dr. Jeb. Oh, great to see you, too. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, it is our honor. And also, I want to thank you for your service uh, to uh, our military. You're teaching at West Point. Describe that work before we talk about Ramapo, your connection to West Point. No, absolutely. So I uh, retired after 39 years of service and a big portion of my time in the service was serving at West Point, uh, particularly as senior faculty and culminating serving as Dean of the Academic Board at West Point. So that was my uh, culminating assignment. And I feel that when people ask me how the transition's been from West Point to Ramapo, it's been very smooth. And it's interesting to see that there's more commonality than anything else across the two institutions. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I often argue learning is learning, teaching is teaching. And I was honored a few years back to actually teach up at West Point, a course on leadership and communication. And the, the students, the cadets up there were just as engaged as anyone would ever want their class to be, their students to be. But the, the question I have is this, but you come to New Jersey and immediately you laugh already, you smile already, and you're dealing with state funding issues. You're dealing with enrollment issues. You're dealing with a whole range of issues that you may have dealt with at West Point, but not in the same way. Biggest challenge you face as president of, of uh, Ramapo College? Yeah, so there are challenges, and actually that's what makes this a very fun and exciting time to be in, in higher ed. So the challenges, especially coming out of the pandemic, and I say coming out of, but I use that loosely since I think we need to remain humble <laughs> in this environment, is I would say the big challenge, based on what our discussions and collaborations have been with the K-12 educators are the learning deficits, wellness deficits, and social development deficits that we're seeing in that space. And we want to make sure that we understand that and that we're collaborating and finding ways to bridge gaps, as well as making sure that we have the resources necessary to really have the um, opportunity that students feel a sense of belonging when they're here on campus. Let me try this. Um, what do you say to parents, others, students as well, potential students? Um, and for many of them, college, higher education, they're not convinced of the investment. They're not convinced of the investment of time, money, and effort. Yes. <clears throat> the value of a college degree today, 2022 and beyond, versus yes. five, 10 years ago. Please. Yes. No, I appreciate the opportunity. And um, I, I want to approach this in a couple of different ways because it's important, especially as we just said, coming out of the pandemic, what we're seeing globally around us, nationally around us, locally around us, because we're all connected. And it really puts our mission in sharp focus. And at the end of the day, I think we can all agree that our world is hungering for ethical leaders who are going to be change agents across all sectors and really advance our society. And I say that because it's a strategic investment 
right? Higher education is strategic investment. And let me explain that a little bit. I don't know if there's another institution that stitches our society together. Coming from the military, I think uh, the military has always prided itself to be part of that tapestry. People coming from all over with different backgrounds in different perspectives and so forth. Besides higher ed, where else do people come from different backgrounds, lived experiences, different perspectives, all with the idea of going through a journey together, right? Of a transformational journey to learn about the world around them, to be critical thinkers, to be able to have empathy and adapt to a changing world. When we think about the kind of world that our students who are entering grade school right now, 65% of them are going to be in jobs that are, don't even exist right now according to the World Economic Forum. Most people are going to change professionally 12 to 15 times according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So the college education, particularly the liberal arts, when we think about how to think and not what to think, by uh, exploring disciplines across STEM and social sciences and humanities and having the outcomes that are going to be necessary to strive to really um, to uh, thrive in a changing world, higher ed is immensely critical. And I would just also like to share with everybody, I'm very proud that Ramapo is part of the Najaski group. I have six sister institutions and collectively, we contribute $6 billion to the New Jersey um, uh, economy, 220 million in tax revenue. 36,000 jobs. There is a dire need when we think about what we can do to contribute to New Jersey specifically, as especially state institutions. One more before I let you go real quick. Uh, we just, I was honored to host a few months back the Raspberry Making a Difference Awards, yes. honoring people who are making a difference. We've had many of them on the air with us as part of our Make a Difference series. Real quick, that was at Ramapo College. Give me yes. 30 seconds or less on what that event was like for you, your first. Yes, I was inspired by, well, you saw that the heroics of phenomenal people who just in the, in the moment did the right thing and that their uh, ethos, if you will, was service to others. And that is what our higher ed institution is all about, is being service oriented, leader oriented, individualized attention so that people are inspired to make a difference. They inspired everyone there in that, uh, in that uh, auditorium that we were in, and I thought uh, it was just a wonderful way to be, again, introduced to the people of New Jersey. Dr. Cindy Jeb is president of Ramapo College of New Jersey. Uh, Dr. Jeb, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. it very much and look forward to seeing you again. We will, stay with us, we'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I thought Booth 47 was Lords of Trenton. Lords of what? Rick, it's the portal. Give her the password. Golden Unicorn. Oh, the comic convention was last week. What? This is an insurance convention. Some insurance companies are known for their mascots. NJM is known for outstanding service you can count on. Do you cover chariots? You could save up to 20% on your auto insurance with NJM, if that's what you mean. It's a minivan. Her name is Pegasus, and she's your ride home. OK. Hi, I'm Dr. Sharif El Nahal. Did you know that there are nearly 4,000 New Jerseyans waiting for a life-saving transplant? and 67% of those people are people of color. Just one organ and tissue donor can save eight lives and enhance the lives of over 75 people. Let's come together to raise awareness in our diverse communities. Donation needs diversity. You have the power to make a difference. For more information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit www.njsharingnetwork.org. We're now joined by the Speaker of the House, uh, Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin. Good to see you, Mr. Speaker. Steve, nice to see you again. How you been? I'm doing great. Listen, let's talk property tax relief. We're taping this at the end of June, be seen a little bit later. There will be a new state budget, we hope on July 1st. What is the anchor property tax, affordable New Jersey communities program, specifically in terms of who gets what in terms of property tax relief and who doesn't? 
Sure. Uh, so what the anchor program is, is the, it started off as the governor's proposal to address the things that are most important to New Jersey. Number one, mainly in for affordability. You know, we got a message back in November uh, at the election time that people were saying we're not, we're not paying enough attention to the things that matter most to them. And affordability is at the top of that list. I think it's something that we all have known for a long time. And so uh, the governor proposed an anchor program, which is uh, you know, builds on the uh, homestead rebate plan that so many people are uh, aware of. Um, uh, but you know, we've had an awful lot of good uh, results in terms of our revenue. Revenue has been stronger than anticipated. I think there's good reasons for that. I think it has to do with some good fiscal stewardship and the way we've managed the state up till now. Um, but it gave us an opportunity, Steve, and uh, and I advocated for uh, uh, expanding that anchor program to include uh, to drive up the, the you know the the people who are going to benefit from that. So it'll if you make uh, up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you get a fifteen hundred dollar tax credit. Uh, if you make two, uh, 150000 to 250000 uh, you get uh, a $1,000 tax credit. What about for renters? Renters also get uh, something, uh, $450 for all renters. That's about up to, nine. Up to $150,000. $150,000, correct. So together, uh, that's over 2 million families that are going to be benefited by this program. And, you know, 100 and, uh, folks uh, who, are, who are in, who are going to get $1,500 uh, tax credit, that takes the effect, the, the rate down, the average rate down to where we were a decade ago. It's a really big deal. Mr. Speaker, let me ask you this. What do you say to those who argue, you know what, a lot of federal money came into the state of New Jersey, the, the COVID relief money. Um, windfall of dollars that revenue that the state never had before that we shouldn't be spending it not only not giving it back but shouldn't be spending it on new programs we should be saving it putting it away when things get rough again and they will particularly if in fact there's a recession speaking Coughlin please so we we're, we're well aware of the fact that the a recession of some degree is is likely uh, we're also well aware of the fact that the federal dollars will eventually be used up for other projects. You know, some of the things that I think we ought to be doing with that are transformative things. I think one of the things that's on the top of everybody's list, the Senate president's list, the governor's list, my list, has to do with water infrastructure and, and flood mitigation and clean water, making sure we have clean water for the generations to come. And if we do that, then we're going to be able to look back 10 years from now and say we did something important and other projects like that. So that's where we're going to we're going to spend that money. Now, the reason to do this now is because it's it, we have the opportunity to help people. Property taxes uh, are uh, in the front of every of what people uh, recognize as a real challenge to their affordability. And uh, you know, we're, we're fighting inflation, which is something that is, is real, but takes a real toll on families uh, by, by helping them uh, through the property tax relief. Uh, we do two things. We address what is primarily important to them, and we allow them to have some extra money to perhaps pay a, a utility bill or to, uh, you know, to spend on their child's education or child care. So I would argue that we we should be spending this uh, this money uh, on the on on people and making sure that they have that boost. Doesn't mean we should we're not going to squander the rest of it though. I got it real quick. You mentioned uh, child care. People who watch us know that we've been doing a long term public awareness program called Reimagine Child Care. The most important child care issue, from your perspective, uh, is what affordability, accessibility, quality. What is it, and why? Well, affordability and accessibility. I think they're they're both. I you know until I've really begun to do a deep dive, I didn't realize that we have childcare deserts in the state of New Jersey, and we need to address that. Uh, affordability is something that I talk to my members uh, about, and I talk to uh, members of the public about uh, being able to uh, afford to send their 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 children to childcare. So we need to address both of those issues, and, and we're going to in this this budget. The the, the real I mean, look the. The other downside to that, the, the fact that child care isn't either readily available or is unaffordable, is it means that a significant portion of, portion of our workforce, uh, awfully talented people, are not going to be able to get back into it, right? Now, that disproportionately falls on women, uh, right? Because that's the folks Minority who, women disproportionately. Absolutely. So giving them the opportunity uh, to get back in the workforce, to succeed, to use their talents, and to you know, achieve their dreams. Uh, that's what this is about. 
Give me, give me 30 seconds on election transparency. There's a package of bills. What is election transparency from your perspective? And what is the role of the state legislature, particularly after the 2020 election with so many people questioning um, the outcome well, of that election? Go ahead, please. Speaker. Right. We just passed a number of bills. Four of them were bipartisan bills. And I just want to say this, Steve, at this point in time in this nation's history, the notion that Democrats and Republicans could come together. I had a bill which was dealt with the way we count uh, vote by mails, uh, posting them and, and making sure things happen in real time so people have the confidence to know that these are things that are, are happening uh, openly, fairly. Those are the, the, you know, the things we want to achieve. Co-sponsoring that bill, first co-sponsor bill was Minority Leader John DeMeo. At this time in our country's history, the notion that Democrats and Republicans could come together to pass election reform, recognizing that it's san you know elections are sacrosanct and that people need to be able to make sure without question that they're open and, and uh, fair, that's historic. We, it really is. It's nothing less than that. Uh, Mike, I, I, you know, the, the folks on, on the, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle de deserve an uh, enormous amount of credit. Uh, and so the folks on my uh, side of the aisle who, who sponsored the bills, we worked together. They took some of our ideas, we took some of their ideas, and we got something good done. It shouldn't be that big a deal that Democrats and Republicans work together to secure our elections. That's why but I couched it. But this apparently time, it is. <laughs> Speaker it is, Coughlin, it is, it is. Um, Speaker of the House, Craig Coughlin, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Wish you all the best. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Nice to be with you. You got it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I thought Booth 47 was Lords of Trenton. Lords of what? Rick, it's the portal. Give her the password. Golden Unicorn. Oh, the comic convention was last week. What? This is an insurance convention. Some insurance companies are known for their mascots. NJM is known for outstanding service you can count on. Do you cover chariots? You could save up to 20% on your auto insurance with NJM, if that's what you mean. It's a minivan. Her name is Pegasus, and she's your ride home. Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Sharif El Nahal. Did you know that there are nearly 4,000 New Jerseyans waiting for a life-saving transplant? And 67% of those people are people of color. Just one organ and tissue donor can save eight lives and enhance the lives of over 75 people. Let's come together to raise awareness in our diverse communities. Donation needs diversity. You have the power to make a difference. For more information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit www.njsharingnetwork.org. We're pleased to once again be joined by our good friend, Ellie Honig, who's a senior analyst at CNN, former federal and state prosecutor, and with a strong connection to Rutgers University. Uh, Ellie, listen, we're taping at the end of June 2022. This will be seen a little bit later. Big picture, the January 6th congressional hearings matter. Why? Particularly those who are watching right now saying, Steve, stop making a big deal about this. It happened. It was a day. There are a lot of other important issues. Inflation, gas prices, the war in, in, in Ukraine. Let's move on. You say, I disagree with those people. I, I think you should not stop making a big deal of this. I, I think people should stop underplaying this. First of all, we are capable, I believe, as, as a democracy, as a country, of addressing multiple things at one time. Yes, we can be concerned about Ukraine and inflation and gas prices, but we also can be very much concerned with what happened on January 6th. I mean, that is foundational to all of the other stuff. If we can't protect our democracy, we're not going to be able to deal with the other issues. So no, we absolutely should not underplay or move on January 6th. Um, I think the committee here is, is trying to serve several different audiences. And while, I, while I've been uh, sort of, I think we need to be careful about the committee's presentation thus far, I think by and large, they've done quite an effective job. They are speaking to the American public. They are speaking to the history books. This is a story that needs to be told fully and completely. And candidly, I think they're speaking to the prosecutors and we're seeing that even more as time goes by, I think we're seeing the committee getting more aggressive and more explicit in the way they're using language around criminal law and calling on DOJ and other prosecutors to, to impose accountability. 
You know, Ali, it's interesting. The last time we had you on, we talked about your book, Hatchet Man, about uh, Bill Barr, uh, the attorney general. But as I'm watching the hearings, and again, this, this isn't really dated because it's historical and it's important and it's evergreen, but it was Bill Barr. Not only Bill Barr, it was obviously Vice President Mike Pence, who did what the Constitution said needed to be done, must be done by a sitting vice president presiding over the United States Senate at that time. It was Bill Barr as attorney general who told the president in Barr's sworn testimony that you believing that the election was stolen from you, uh, President Trump, is BS. He stood his ground and the president was livid with him. Did Bill Barr not do the right thing for the nation at that time? Bill Barr did do the right right thing for the nation at that time. And by the way, Steve, there's a long list of people I think here who, who were Trump's enablers and helped Trump spread the big lie before the election, who ultimately stood up and did the right thing. Mike Pence and Bill Barr are probably one and two on that list. And, and there, there tends to be this absolutism where people say, oh, how can you praise Mike Pence? He did all these bad things. Bill, Barr, I wrote a whole book criticizing Bill Barr. Okay. But people can have done plenty of bad, but also in the end, done the right thing. It doesn't cancel out all the bad. I think we need to consider all of it. It's been really interesting to see Bill Barr emerge as sort of one of the star witnesses in his videotape uh, deposition testimony that we've been seeing, because indeed, he did stand up as attorney general, belatedly, I would argue, because he spent many months, I document this in my book, propping up the lie of election fraud. But ultimately, in December, three, three weeks or so after the election, he did tell Donald Trump and he did tell the public there's no evidence of election fraud. It's good that Bill Barr did that. I do think it's important to note, however, and this is a point I was alluding to earlier, we need to keep in mind as we're seeing this committee presentation, it is bipartisan. There are Republicans on the committee, but it's also one-sided in terms of viewpoint. Uh, this is not necessarily the same thing as a criminal trial. There's no defense lawyer present. Well, what's there's the no other point of view? Yeah, well, no, look, it's a good point, right? I don't know what the counter narrative is to January 6th, but let me use Bill Barr as an example, because Bill Barr says to the committee, well, I resigned because Donald Trump was pushing these baseless election fraud theories, um, and because he was, I think the quote from Bill Barr was detached from reality. Now you hear that and right. you go, wow. But if there was cross-examination of Bill Barr, a good lawyer would say, really? That's your story now, because when you resigned, you wrote a letter to Donald Trump on December 14th of 2020, and you said in that that you were continuing to investigate allegations of, of voter fraud, which you did so say. So it contradicts, okay, you're looking, yeah. Ali, I appreciate you looking at that from a legal perspective because you're a legal analyst, <laughs> but at the same time, and quote the other perspective, here's another perspective, yeah. let me play devil's advocate. I love sure. when people say, let's be fair, okay, Sometimes I think truth is truth, and other times I think it's gray, and there are different perspectives on it. So this is another perspective, Ali, react to it. This is a piece in the Associated Press, um, Jill Colvin, C-O-L-V-I-N. And this is, she's quoting Donald Trump, where the president says, the footage shown during the he hearing had been doctored. He downplayed it. This is President Trump downplaying January 6th, saying it was a, quote, simple protest that got out of hand. That's another point of view. Dead wrong. Both of those things are dead wrong. I, I disagree with Donald Trump on both of those things. The, and again, I don't know what the counter narrative is to January 6th. Let's take, for example- Could the counter narrative be, no matter what he was told by anyone else, he believed that the election was stolen. He well, believed that, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not so sure that I buy into that, but let me say this. My point is, we need to be careful about seeing what the committee is doing, and people are doing this. They're looking at the committee's evidence and saying, well, just put that in criminal court and it's game over. My point there is there are different ball games with different rules. What happens in the committee is not the same thing. It's not the same burden prosecutors need to be thinking about. So let's start with that. I agree with you. There's no substantive defense to what we're seeing here. There's no counter narrative to January 6th. In contrast, let's take Ukraine, right? There was, I think it was wrong, but you could say, well, it wasn't a quid pro quo, at least that you can understand what the other guy's going to say. So I think we agree on that point. However, yeah. to those watching, many of whom are my friends who voted for Donald Trump, that's your business. But a lot of them are either cops or yep. they are pro-cop. I consider myself pro-law enforcement uh, while acknowledging serious, um, horrific events, incidents, patterns that disproportionately affect black and brown people, particularly those who are men, uh, by white cops. 
I acknowledge that. That being said, but some of my friends and others who call themselves pro-cops, who saw those law enforcement professionals being attacked, assaulted, some killed. What is the possible excuse for that? And where is the other side to that? There is none. I 100% agree with you. My, my point is just limited to let's not take everything that the committee is showing us and draw the very quick, facile conclusion that, well, this would be an easy slam dunk. So Merrick Garland, as attorney general, should step in, prosecute, prosecute Donald Trump, prosecute John Eastman, who the attorney who was telling him these things, say you just won, uh, oh. Rudy Giuliani, say you just won, let's take control of the election, of the, uh, the, the, the machines. Et cetera, that's ex martial law. You're saying criminally a lot harder than politically influencing public opinion, which, P.S., I'm not convinced that those who really believe in and love Donald Trump, and I say love because some say that, are devoted to him, whether they even care about these hearings, Ellie. Maybe they don't. Uh, and everyone obviously has their own ability to decide whether they care. I have, I care a lot about these hearings. I think they're very important for our, for our democracy. Um, and look, it is a very difficult decision that the prosecutors have to make. One of the interesting things that I think has been really revealing, Stephen, you, you alluded to this, is we're seeing more evidence than we've ever seen before that Donald Trump knew or, or had to have known that he lost the election and that his theories were bogus. And, you know, one of the questions that's been coming up is, well, what if he was just in denial, right? What if he just chose to believe Rudy and, and John Eastman and to disregard Bill Barr and his own campaign lawyers and his own staff? And the answer and his own to that daughter, is, Ivanka, I believe, said um, right. she believed Bill Barr. She believed Bill Barr. That her, that her, her father lost. Yeah, and so people, people have asked the question, well, how then can a prosecutor establish that he knew? What if he's just sort of delusional or, or, or you know, kids himself? And my answer to that is an important legal concept called willful blindness. If you're trying to prove intent in a case like this, Steve, there's two ways to do it. One is the person knew. If you had a recording of Donald Trump saying, uh, this is hypothetical, I know I lost this thing, but let's just do our best to try to steal it. I mean, that's, you know, or if he admitted it, sometimes people do admit things. But you also can get there legally, prosecutorially, by showing willful blindness. The example that judges use when they're instructing juries is like an ostrich putting his head in the sand. And I would argue here that's exactly what we have. We have Donald Trump saying, I'm going to cover my ears and cover my eyes to all of these sort of credible people, the people Bill Stepien, Jersey guy, uh, called Team Normal, shutting all of them out even though there was way more voices, way more credible, and saying, I'm only going to listen to these selected three or four people who are telling me what I want to hear. I would argue that that's sort of a textbook case of willful blindness. And Ellie Honig, who's a senior uh, legal analyst at CNN, former federal and state prosecutor, Jersey guy. Thank you, Ellie. Appreciate it, my friend. Thanks, we'll Steve. Talk Appreciate soon. it. Talk to you soon. See you next time, folks. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Seton Hall University, the Turrell Fund, supporting Reimagine Child Care, New Jersey Sharing Network, RWJ Barnabas Health, IBEW Local 102, Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters, NJM Insurance Group, Fedway Associates, Inc., and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by R-O-I-N-J and by NJ.com. I thought Booth 47 was Lords of Trenton. Lords of what? Rick, it's the portal. Give her the password. Golden Unicorn. Oh, the comic convention was last week. What? This is an insurance convention. Some insurance companies are known for their mascots. NJM is known for outstanding service you can count on. Do you cover chariots? You could save up to 20% on your auto insurance with NJM, if that's what you mean. It's a minivan. Her name is Pegasus, and she's your ride home. OK. Hi, I'm Dr. Sharif El Nahal. Did you know that there are nearly 4,000 New Jerseyans waiting for a life-saving transplant? And 67% of those people are people of color. Just one organ and tissue donor can save eight lives and enhance the lives of over 75 people. 
Let's come together to raise awareness in our diverse communities. Donation needs diversity. You have the power to make a difference. For more information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit www.njsharingnetwork.org.